happy to welcome you back for our uh, last of the three series uh, afternoon talks. Um, uh, Vincent Smeets and Yurian Nakakeke will be presenting their project over investigating user needs and the true reason why people read news. Take it away. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, we are going to talk about uh, revealing the true motives of news readers um, well, at DPG Media. Uh, we already did, of course, the short introduction. Um, let's just skip to uh, what is DPG Media. Um, it's a publishing company originated in Belgium and now also has a pretty, pretty big, big market share in the Netherlands. And we offer a lot of different brands, newspapers, magazines, but also a lot of online brands. And so we gather a lot of data, uh, of course, user data, but also a lot of content. It's kind of the foundation of the, bill, of, the, of the enterprise. And when you think about content, you might think about personalization. And when we think about personalization, we think about what is the best content we, we can offer to a user, what is the best experience, and what do they actually need from us, need from the news. So that is what we are going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to focus, be focusing on user needs and how we can predict user needs based on the text of an article. And we're going to walk you through our whole process from the start to uh, the labeling, fine tuning, and also some results and next steps. But first of all, uh, why are the user needs actually important? Um, and well, we didn't think of the thought of them ourselves. Uh, the BBC did a very big investigation and they uh, came up with these six user needs uh, because apparently these were the needs, uh, the main uh, characteristics that people were actually, actually looking for when they are reading the news. So that's quite interesting, but they also found out that it is quite important to have an equally balanced, uh, to, to equally balance your content across these user needs to have more satisfied, more loyal, and more engaged customers, and just also to get more clicks. So that's a very interesting insight because they also found out that within most media companies, that is not at all the case. And also within DPG Media, uh, the user needs are quite skewed. A lot of the news is just update me, give me the information, but that is not what a lot of people, a lot of readers are actually looking for. So um, we uh, are now using user needs in two ways. You can, of course, use it in an editorial way, because when you see how a Divert Me article is written, you actually know um, how to write also other articles, and you can actually write about a topic and write uh, about that topic in many different ways to address many different user needs. So that's an interesting insight. But furthermore, of course, just for marketing personalization, when you see, for example, those five articles, you can easily distinguish what the dominant user need is. And when you know the dominant user need, you can, of course, use it for bannering, for newsletters. And we already did uh, a test with personalized bannering, and we actually saw when we added the user needs to the banners, we got an improved click-through rate of 13.5%. So quite some decent results. Uh, but we didn't actually just use the user needs from the uh, BBC. We changed them a little bit in order to make them fit a little better to DPG. And we also defined them a little bit uh, better in order to make a better fit uh, with our company. And we actually also combined the last two, the touch me and the connect me. But that was also just a, a data issue because we didn't have that much articles <laughs> relating to that user need. So it was more easy to classify it by just combining the two. So we are actually using five user needs. Now let's talk a little bit about the labeling process, uh, because at first we have a lot of data, but we have no labels. So we just started with a couple of thousands of randomly selected articles. We had three labelers and we just started labeling. And the articles were from the three biggest Dutch newspaper titles. Uh, we trained a BERT model, and within that BERT model, as you probably know, you can only um, analyze the first 512 tokens. So we sampled the, sampled the article text because a lot of the articles are a lot longer than that. And we just took the beginning and the end and a little bit of the middle. And well, as you can see, the first results were actually quite good. Overall accuracy, almost 80%, and all user needs individually also scored pretty well. But the problem was, um, within the first iteration, well, it wasn't really including in that phase, but 
We only had, of course, label data from the Dutch news. But we also have Belgium articles. We also have magazine articles. And do they actually are represented in the training? Well, probably not. But we still scored all the articles, so also, the also the magazine. So in the next iteration, we thought, all right, we also need to include those titles, those magazines, those newspapers. So we did another, uh, another round, and we actually labeled another 4,000 articles. But now we did it with 18 labelers. So we got a lot of people from the company, and we gave them some training, and we were really happy because we thought, all right, this goes a lot faster than with three labelers. So we actually trained it in the similar manner, but as you can see, the results after quite some months of work were pretty bad. And what we concluded, all right, you can get a lot of labelers, but if they are not consistent, if they are not trained well, and we thought we really focused on that, but still we didn't, and believe me, we tried a lot of different ways, but the result kept on being uh, quite sad. So, well, we eventually needed to uh, conclude that it was kind of a waste of time, but still, of course, we learned a lot about the process. And the last phase, uh, that is the phase we're actually looking, uh, working with right now, it's we reduced the 18 labelers again to three. We still are using um, articles over all the titles that we have, but we are now ju not just focusing on random articles, but we are focusing on articles where the model that we already have has difficulty predicting. Because we already have scores, and a lot of the articles are, of course, pretty easy for the model to predict. But there are also a lot of articles who are where the max, prob the max probability is quite low. And that is interesting, of course, for labelers to look at and to see, all right, can we improve the model with those articles? So um, we took 500 uh, articles like that, and we also adjusted um, the sampling of the articles. Because we talked with our editorial manager, and he said, every article has an introduction. But the introduction, apparently, in every article is kind of the same. So even if you are, uh, have your Connect Me article, the, the intro is quite just giving the facts, like it's in a, an Update Me article. So he says, just remove it from every article, because the rest of the article, that is where the interesting information is in, and it's probably a lot easier for the model to recognize the user need without that intro. And he says well, like the, the, the end of the article is also not important. Just, just focus on the beginning without the intro, and it will probably, probably work best. So we just gave, it, uh, gave the article like that um, to the model, focused on the first 512 tokens. And that is also in the labeling process where we looked at. We only looked in the labeling uh, at the first 512 tokens. And the results were actually quite, uh, quite good, uh, because the overall uh, accuracy increase uh, was a little better than the first model, but as I mentioned, it is only uh, based on the more difficult articles, and the first one model was focusing on all the articles. So we were quite happy uh, with just those 500 uh, labeled articles that we got similar results as the first model. And, well, what we actually did is just set up a whole active learning flow, a pipeline, um, and now we are actually scoring every day all our articles and so that we know which are the difficult articles, and we build up a data set. And all our labelers are, ab are able with our uh, own web application just to select their own label set. They can do that by se themselves, and they can just start labeling. And when we have enough trained data, we actually retrain the model again and again just to see if the model improves. And if the model improves, we just replace the old model with the new model. So it's a continuous process we are currently working with in production. And, of course, continuous monitoring is very important, um, so all of the labelers are able to look at the results themselves and see if their labeling efforts actually paid off. So, that's a little bit about that. Now, Jurian is going to yeah. talk a little bit more about the fine-tuning. Thank you. Um, yeah, as, as Vincent said, that's mostly the process we're in, but we're also on the PyData conference where we want to go a bit deeper into what we technically did. So, this part is more about 
for all the different models that we estimated, so the version one, but also the later versions, what steps did we take to train such a model, to train a model that is able to predict what category an article belongs to, what user need it belongs to. And it, it has five steps, you could say. So first, I'm going to tell a bit about the, the setup. What did we use? What kind of technique did we use? What kind of packages did we use? Then I'm going to talk a bit about the data we have available. We have article data. Actually, we use it in two ways. I'm going to talk about that. Then a post-training of an LM. Uh, going into detail there, uh, and we did a two-step for the user need for the last one. So for the user need prediction, we first did a hyperparameter search, and for the second part, we did a fine-tuning with some more uh, a grid search. So just to sh give you some more insights in uh, under the hood what we did to predict the user needs. So first of all, what did we use? Maybe you saw in the flow of Vincent that there was a lot of data IQ icons there for those who know uh, data IQ. Actually, we work in DPG mo mostly in, da in, in data IQ for, for most of our things, but we switched here to data bricks because it was, for us, as, as data scientists, was most easy to dare get a, a GPU cluster that fit, fit our needs. So we don't want to wait too long. We also don't want to spend too much money, uh, so we want to do that in a, in a responsible way to be able to tune it, tune it up, tune it back. So we uh, we use uh, we use Databricks. We use an, a number of uh, Python packages. Maybe some are uh, known to you, others are not. So we mainly build on uh, Hugging Face. Uh, their 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 great work. So the Transformers uh, um, uh, package and the Datasets package. All the data that we have, we put it in Datasets dictionaries. Um, that's that's really a, a convenient way to to work with it. We had to sw switch, uh, we have to, to, to go to RVS and back, so we, we used some package for there. Under the hood, there's storage. SK Learn mainly to look at the measures and to have some custom metrics we want to evaluate on. As Vincent already said, it's not only the overall accuracy, but it's also specific accuracy, so we use it for that. Optuna for the hyperparameter uh, search, and MLflow to register all our models and to be able to go back to the best one we found and to be able to also uh, yeah, explain what the best model is. So these are this is the training setup we used. Then about the articles, because as Vincent already said, DPG Media, a lot of brands, I think more than 50 now, uh, all publishing articles. That means that we have a lot of data available. And we want to use LLMs, um, uh, and we can use them, um, but we've also uh, uh, post-trained those LLMs a bit to make those more applicable to DPG use cases. One is user needs, but others are sentiment of headers, other models. So we have actually made our own LM that is more custom to DPG data, and we can use it. So that's why we could use, actually, not only the labeled articles. Vincent already told it's quite a hassle to get good labels. So, but for the, um, uh, for the first part, we could use all articles. I'm going to discuss in a, in a bit how we use those. And we have the labels, the articles that, that Vincent already uh, talked about, so about 11,000 in total. Those are by hand, by labelers, uh, uh, labeled for the user needs. An important thing is that we split the data into the, the different slices so we can easily evaluate how good is this model in general, but also how good is it for Belgium, uh, for the Flemish language and for the Dutch language, because there is a difference. Those of you who are Flemish, will say, yes, it's really different. So there are different words used, different uh, 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 text, but also different uh, constructs there. So we had to check if the model that we are training now is actually better and doing better for, for that, and also news and magazines. So there's different kind of, uh, kind of content. So we have to evaluate on that if we're doing better. So that's, that's good. And we combined them in the, uh, the data set dictionaries uh, that are a part of the Hugging Face data set. So that, and in the end, yeah, well, if you work with transformer models, you know you cannot just put in the text, you have to tokenize it. You have to translate the words to tokens that the model knows where it's trained on. So that's also part of the, of the preparing the data that we translated, the text that we have to tokens, and those tokens can be used in our transformer model uh, training. So that's phase two. Um, then the fine tuning. So as I said, actually we have two parts in our training. And we call this one to prevent a bit of uh, misunderstanding, a, a post-training. So actually, we use a pre-trained model. That's a Robot 2022 model. That's Dutch. It's trained on Dutch data, a lot of Dutch data. Also a bit on newspaper data. So you could say oh, that's already in there. But it's also trained 
on uh, social media data, other data, all Dutch data available. Um, and, and it's quite good. It, it outperforms the model that we used earlier was the Bertje model. And this was already quite uh, better also because it's more recent. So it's post-COVID. So the first model we used didn't have any context of, of COVID. And it's obviously in the news quite important the last few years. Um, so we used that one as a starting point. But we, we post-trained it on those uh, uh, 580,000 uh, articles we have from DP DP DPG to have it more accustomed to, to the news articles that we have. So in that case, it's, it's, it's better suited, not only for the user needs, where we have quite some labels, but also for other questions that we have. And we could do few shot learning with this model, and that's why we use this model uh, as a starting point also for the fine tuning here. Because, yeah, we can use all those models because actually there we perform the mass language modeling task. There the model says, well, I'm just going to uh, mask about 15% of, uh, uh, of all tokens and predict what was the token or the word that was there. So the model doesn't have to have label data. It, it has its own label data. So that's, all the, that's the thing ab uh, about these, these models, that it's, they can be trained without label data. So we now have, after this phase, we have a model that is actually the robot 22, but it's the DPG robot 22, you could say. So it's custom to our own uh, data. And with that as a starting point, we can look at how we can use it to predict user needs. So here we used also, as a first step, we used Optuna, that's another package you can use to do some hyperparameter search. And it's good because you have still have quite some hyperparameters you have to optimize if you have this uh, such a transformer model. And this resulted for us into a good starting point where still to do some research afterwards, but we have a better starting point for some important hyperparameters like the learning rate, weight decay, the train epochs we want to do, uh, and, and some others. So these are important uh, parameters you want to, uh, to tune and to see what are the best and optimal values for, for the context I have. And it depends on the data, it depends on your question you have, what the optimal uh, uh, values are. So it's, it's good to have a good starting point there and to not to lose too much time. Uh, so we, 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 we did that, and that resulted for us into a good set of starting point uh, parameters. Um, but then we still wanted to do a grid search over some uh, other parameters. So still the epochs and the batch size and the learning rate, we still wanted to vary around the optimal value to see what really was the best thing. Also looking at the different slices we wanted to look at, so not the overall performance only, but also for Belgium versus ne Netherlands, also for magazine versus uh, uh, news. Um, and we also tried to maybe oversample the smaller uh, categories to see if that worked. So that was also one of the things in, in our grid search. And even mo multimodal to see, okay, maybe we know some other information about the articles that might help in predicting the user needs. So what is uh, the author, what is the category it's placed on, on the website, other things. In the end, actually, we saw that uh, a transformer model is quite capable of, of of, of collecting that, so it doesn't need this extra information. So most, most of the things we added were not valuable, and in the end we, we could skip them, but we did test if it would help to, to add those. And as I said a few slides ago, it's important for us to look at the metrics that count for us. So there's not one number of one uh, best uh, F1 or one uh, best precision. We really have to see if we're able for the different slices in our articles, Dutch, Netherlands, uh, magazine, uh, uh, Dutch, uh, uh, Belgium, and magazine, uh, uh, and news, if it's performing well on all the user needs. So we don't want a model that's really under really, really underperforming for one user need. We know that some user needs are quite difficult to, 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 to grasp because they're quite related to other ones, um, and we don't have a lot of training data on it, but still we want to do it as good as we can. So that's, that's important, so we had to write some, some custom metrics for that. Um, and actually all the evaluations we did resulted in insights in the best hyperparameters, but also, as Vincent already told, also in some upstream things. So we had to go back and say, well, we tried a lot of things, but we're seeing that we're not improving. Uh, so we, for instance, the inter-rater reliability, it was quite low. So we had to make the decision to say, well, uh, if, if the same article by two different uh, raters is, is, is dead, uh, one says it's uh, user need one and the other says you need two, the model cannot figure that out. So we have to, go, have, to have good data. So 
we learned a lot on there also about the quality of the data, and we sometimes, unfortunately, we had to go back, re reduce the number of la labelers, and also the process of, of labeling. We had extra checks. If we had a discussion about it, we had to together have to, had to look at it. So that, that was really important. We had a lot of learnings there. In the end, we evaluated on these kind of uh, stats. Maze. Mostly, I won't go into, into all details there. We wanted to see if we would improve overall and see that all the categories would get better. These, res these numbers are quite low because here we're zooming in in those most difficult cases. As Vincent already said, in our active learning setup, we only label those articles that are really difficult for the model. We added 20% to also have a random sample of all articles. But most of those articles are quite difficult for the model. So that's why the overall scores are not that high. But we do see that our new model really improves on the, the performance. So we learned a lot, uh, actually, in, 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 in the process, and mainly not only about the model and how to tune it, but also about how to gather the data and how to instruct the laborers. We spent a lot of time instructing the laborers where we saw we really have to be in good control. And it's also very, very important to keep on monitoring if, uh, if the model performs well. So that's what Vincent already sh showed. We have this active learning setup where we constantly monitor if the model is, is, is getting worse, and then we know that we have to label new uh, uh, articles, and those are automatically used to update the model. And if the model improves, that one goes to production. So that's, that's the loop we saw. We also saw that we have to keep it simple, and it sounds quite obvious maybe, but it's quite tempting to say, well, let people not say one user need per article, but let's give a distribution of probabilities for user needs. But it's a really complex task to ask a labeler, I'll give it 80% to user need one and 20% to user need B, or let them score it or rate it on a paragraph level. That increases the amount of tasks they have to do enormously. So all those things we always have to check are we overcomplifying things? So no, let's not do that. And we saw in, in the end that we could improve without those things. So that's good. As a last point, yeah. As a last point, it's um, uh, what we're working on now. We want actually want to, uh, the model is now in production. Each article that is published is immediately scored with our model. You get the max user need and you get the probability per user need. But we want to have it earlier in the process when someone's writing an article actually has to see what, it, what the user need is that he's writing. So he can still change the article. So now we're in a process to get actually our model in the content planner and that's actually the environment where someone writes the article and then he can still change the article. So we're more in the core of actually of the journalism. So that's, that's cool. So. So this is actually what we wanted to uh, share about our model. Are there any questions? First off, a round of applause.